So here's the thing about tonight's show. I disagree with Liz Cheney about everything. Um, my whole adult life on everything in politics, I would not just say that Liz Cheney and I were on different proverbial teams. I would say we are uh, from different proverbial planets. <laughs> and they are planets that are mostly at war with each other. Um, and she's a politician. I'm not a politician. I'm just a person. Um, but I am definitely a liberal, and she is definitely a hardcore conservative. And I disagree with Liz Cheney on, like, really, on everything you can think of, on the environment, on um, abortion rights, profoundly. I think she's not just wrong on abortion. She is capital W wrong on abortion in a terrible way. Uh, I disagree with her vehemently on voting rights and on the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and our relationship or lack thereof with Iran and our approach to terrorism and torture and guns and like mining and intellectual property and the rules of the House of Representatives. Honestly, I once even got mad at Liz Cheney about fishing. I mean, it's the one thing you'd think we'd have in common, right? Even on fishing, I got mad at her about something. We are opposites. And again, in some ways, this is funny and dumb, but it is also, it, I have to tell you, in being truly honest, um, it, it has been a serious thing to me. It has been part of how I understand myself in my political time as an American that I am someone fundamentally opposed to the politics of Liz Cheney and her father, Dick Cheney, who was White House chief of staff and defense secretary before he was vice president. And what I still believe was the fundamentally disastrous George W. Bush administration in which Liz Cheney also served. I literally started writing books in the first place more than a decade ago, because I had so much to get off my chest about what I thought was wrong with the Cheney family approach to war and foreign policy. The first book I ever wrote was inspired by Dick Cheney's minority report in the Iran-Contra scandal during the Reagan administration. That first book I ever wrote is literally dedicated to him. To former Vice President Dick Cheney, oh, please let me interview you. <laughs> and that feeling extended to his daughter, who is his political descendant, both literally and proverbially in, in every way. And <laughs> you want one more level of it? There's one more level of it. As, as dedicated as Liz Cheney is to her father, Dick Cheney, they are profoundly close as father and daughter. She is profoundly loyal to him. There is not room for a piece of paper to slide between them on policy. As close as they are, as much as she reveres her dad, I feel the same way about my dad. I wear, I wear one piece of jewelry. I wear my dad's high school ring. My dad is, is brilliant and kind, and as far as I can tell, he is right about absolutely everything. He's an Air Force veteran. He's a very careful lawyer. And my whole life, my dad was kind of the soul of moderation when it came to politics until Liz's dad. The Dick Cheney vice presidency had the effect of an almost religious conversion on my own dad, moving his politics what seemed to be about 50 points west of where they had ever been before. So vehemently did he object, as did I, to Cheney brand republicanism during the George W. Bush era. So it's, it's weird. Like, they're the big, I think the Cheney family is the biggest touchstone that I have in American politics in my lifetime. It is a funny thing, but it's also personal and real, and it is a thing that matters to me. And I say this tonight, not for the just the gee whiz factor of me having Liz Cheney here tonight, me having somebody here tonight who you'd never expect. I say this not for just the, you know, man bites dog weirdness of this. I say it because I think in civic terms, in sort of American citizenship terms, I think it's really important how much we disagree. It's important how far apart we are in every policy issue imaginable. It is important that Liz Cheney is infinity and I am negative infinity on the ideological number line. It's important because that tells you how serious and big something has to be to put us, to put me and Liz Cheney together on the same side of something in American life. It's also valuable to have a conservative Republican member of Congress writing about something we can't see from the outside. 
what's going on among conservative Republicans behind closed doors while they're giving in to this anti-democratic plot. We learned, for example, on page 124 of Liz Cheney's new book that a senior Republican staffer on the Rules Committee wrote in the Republican staff memo on impeachment less than a week after the January 6th attack on Congress. This is the Republican staff memo. The person wrote that Trump had committed impeachable offenses, calling what Trump did, quote, a serious act political in nature that corrupted or subverted the political process and threatened the order of political society. That's the Republican staff memo on impeachment after January 6th, previously unreported. We learn on page 74 that the day before January 6th, Kevin McCarthy's general counsel, the top lawyer for the top Republican in the House, told Congressman Mike Johnson that the effort he was organizing to get House Republicans to sign on to Trump's effort to overthrow the election was an effort that was wildly unconstitutional in its basis. Quote, later that night, I heard from Kevin McCarthy's chief counsel, Michaela Carr. She told me she had made clear to Mike Johnson that his letter was wrong. She said that he knew it was. She said he pushed back very strongly. She, excuse me. She said she pushed back very strongly when they discussed it that afternoon. And then Cheney quotes from an email. He knows he is wrong on the fundamental constitutional principle. And his argument that he has some sort of power to individually determine, absent due process of any sort, that a state didn't meet their constitutional obligation, and then that the remedy should be that, without any process whatsoever, the federal, cross federal Congress gets to overturn the will of the people, is astonishing. Astonishing. That's the top lawyer serving the top Republican in the House, telling him that what he's doing is unconstitutional as he's doing it. Mike Johnson, of course, is now no longer just an anonymous backbench member of Congress. He's now the leader. He's now the Republican Speaker of the House. Page 32 of her book, Liz Cheney describes communications with senior Republican staffers in the, uh, on Capitol Hill about the court filing that Mike Johnson, in fact, led as part of Trump's election challenge, concluding that he might personally have ethical issues as a lawyer, as in with his professional accreditation for having made factual assertions to the court in that brief about things he didn't actually have factually inf factual information about. As you know, lots of Trump lawyers have faced professional punishment for lies they told on Trump's behalf after the election. Liz Cheney, in her new book, effectively asserts that the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, might be one of those lawyers. On page 228, she says Congressman Jim Jordan, who was very nearly Speaker himself, she says he may need the assistance of a criminal lawyer for sorting out the conflicting claims he made during congressional testimony about his communications with former President Trump while the January 6th attack was underway. On page 18 of her book, Jim Jordan gets this from Liz Cheney, quote, Jordan did make a memorable pitch to me to join the group. It went something like this. Would you consider joining the Freedom Caucus? We don't have any women and we need one. Cheney says, tempting as this offer was, I took a pass. On page 153, here's Liz Cheney's goodbye to Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. Quote, other members said they were upset that my impeachment vote had caused them trouble at home. They thought I should have provided them cover for their votes against impeachment. I had heard this complaint from an angry Elise Stefanik of New York. She told me that because of my vote to impeach, people were writing letters to the editor of her local newspapers, criticizing her and asking why she hadn't taken the same principled stand that I had. Cheney says, quote, that seemed less my problem than hers. Many of us who had known Elise Stefanik since before she abandoned all principle were curious about how she had lost her sense of right and wrong. Cheney says, a number of the men who spoke in favor of removing me from leadership said they didn't like my tone. I wasn't contrite enough, nor had I learned my lesson. Ralph Norman of South Carolina kept repeating that his problem with me was my attitude. You've just got such a defiant attitude. A couple of my male colleagues were so enraged by my unwillingness to apologize that they got themselves really worked up and seemed on the verge of tears as they lectured me. I tried to follow what the most emotional members were saying, but it wasn't always easy. Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania, for example, seemed angry because I had released a statement before I voted. In an effort to describe how upset he was, Mike Kelly said, it's like you're playing in the biggest game of your life and you look up and see your girlfriend sitting on the opponent's side. Cheney says, 
These were grown men. This was 2021. I was standing at the podium at the front of the auditorium thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Other female members started yelling, she's not your girlfriend. Yeah, I said, I'm not your girlfriend. She really isn't, truly. And they're so upset about her tone and about her not taking their feelings into account. Uh, but she doesn't take their feelings into account. <laughs> she is relentless. Let me ask you about um, a moment in your book that happens on January 4th. Uh, it's described in Chapter 9 of your book, and you describe listening in on a call um, in which Trump lawyers are briefing um, what we call surrogates. So it's mm. basically people are going to go on TV and talk about the pro-Trump side of things. Yeah. And on that call, Laura, Trump lawyer Jenna Ellis describes what they're envisioning for January 6th. She says, uh, the way you write it is, in the scenario Ellis described, when Pence was presiding, he could either refuse to open or refuse to count the electoral votes. So they don't necessarily know you're on this call. You're listening in. Right. It's two days before January 6th. Was that the moment when it really became clear to you in detail what they were going to try to do? Uh, yes. You know, I had heard, obviously, there had been talk about uh, we're going to have these electors meet. I think Stephen Miller had been talking about that. But it wasn't clear to me um, what the, the contours of this particular part of the plan were um, until I dialed into that phone call. And listening to them describe how these fake electors were going to be used and um, the fact that they anticipated that Vice President Pence was going to use them to refuse to count the legitimate electors was certainly a moment of, of uh, intense concern. And, and as I got off that call, I ran into the Capitol, uh, into the office of the parliamentarian of the House to say, you know, wait a minute, th this is what I'm hearing is going to happen. What do we do about it in the joint session? How do we stop this? And, um, and it was very clear that uh, there were not a lot of good answers to that because I, I knew, I learned later through the investigation that Vice President Pence and his counsel were having discussions with the Senate parliamentarian and that the Vice President, you know, ultimately, of course, did his duty bravely. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a joint session of Congress, you know, you're, you're not in a position where uh, there are a lot of legislative steps that you can take uh, except to, to basically, you know, move to adjourn. Uh, so it was a very dangerous and chilling moment. Liz, you focus very early on in the book on the fact that Trump, two days after he lost the election, um, he fired the defense secretary. Why do you think he did that? Why is that important? Well, um, first of all, to have a situation where a president who's lost the election, and so we should be going through a transition. And a transition is a period of time when the United States is particularly potentially vulnerable. And especially at the, the Defense Department, you have to have a, a nonpartisan uh, tr transition. You have to have a situation where people are very focused on what is the good of the country. And people recognize we may have lost the election, but those politics should not um, be part of any kind of decisions that are being made, especially during a transition period. And so to see Donald Trump fire his defense secretary, um, and we know now, of course, much more about what was happening at the time. I was very concerned at the time. He was also replacing other senior leaders at the department. Um, we know now, for example, that he had um, told Johnny McEntee at one point uh, to ensure that the secretary of the Army and the chief of staff of the Army knew that if they issued any more statements saying that the U.S. military had no role in our elections, uh, that they would be fired. And um, that's a, you know, when you combine that with the steps that we know Mike Flynn was urging him to take, Mike Flynn was urging be taken publicly, things like deploying the military in order to rerun elections in swing states. And I think that's one of the real dangers people have to focus on when we think about a potential second Trump administration. You will take those people who were the most radical, the most dangerous, who had the, the proposals that were the most dangerous, and he will put them in positions of, of you know, supreme power. Mm. Uh, and that's, that is, uh, that, that's a risk that we simply can't take. One of the other things that you've talked about um, in terms of a, a second round and whether or not January 6th was sort of a dress rehearsal or first effort and they'll be better at it the second time around, is the prospect that um, after the 2024 election, Maybe Republicans will still be in control in the House. Maybe Mike Johnson would still be speaker. Given what Mike Johnson did 
in and in around in and around the 2020 election. What is the risk in terms of him potentially still being Speaker of the House, him controlling the House of Representatives in the aftermath of the next election? Um, you know, it is it's 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 terrifying. And and I say that um, with no no pleasure. It, it pains me that that's where we are. But you were friends with him. I was. We were elected the same year. Our offices were next door to each other. And I believed Mike to be uh, a man of principle. Um, what I learned was that he was willing to do things he knew to be wrong in order to placate Donald Trump. And, and again, a situation where you have a Speaker of the House who, as you detailed at the beginning of the show, so clearly set aside what he knew to be the facts, what he knew to be the law, what he knew to be our obligations under the Constitution, um, in order to try to help Donald Trump in his efforts in 2020, we, we cannot count on uh, on a majority of Republicans, on someone like that, um, to do the right thing, to uphold the Constitution. If, for example, we had an election that was thrown into the House, uh, if, if nobody got 270 electoral votes. So it's, it's really serious. Or if they needed to certify the electoral count? Yeah. yeah. I feel like... Um, what you describe as a cult of personality was more likely to emerge on the right than on the left. Um, because I feel like people on the right have been getting told by the Republican Party my whole adult life that government is the problem, like Ronald Reagan said, and we need voting restrictions because vote, because Democrats cheat. And, um, you know, the, the, we need unregulated guns, not just for hunting and self-defense, but because we need to stand up against our government tyranny and all the stuff that maybe works in the short term, but in the long term builds toward radicalism and I think opens the right more up to a cult of personality than the left. And I know we probably disagree on that strongly. I think that's we do disagree on that. Um, but what I would say is the way that I look at it is those of us on the right in this moment have a particularly great responsibility and duty because this threat has emerged from the right. Yeah. We can talk about why that was. I think that, that, you know, frankly, there are millions of people around the country who feel like they aren't heard. And, and Donald Trump managed to convince them that he would be their voice, um, you know, which is, of course, a, a complete lie, but they bought it. And, and he preyed on that patriotism. But, but right now, it's, I think, partly why I have been so... Um, so disappointed uh, with what I've seen from other members of my party um, in their unwillingness to step up. I think we have a particular duty to step up. You look ahead to a year from now, um, heading into the next election cycle. Um, if Trump wins, if Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party and he wins and he's back in power, what is your life like and what do you think the, the, the noble, patriotic, righteous fight is to save the country at that point? Uh, I, I don't even want to imagine uh, a situation where he has won. I think we have to do everything we can um, to stop him in terms of, again, the kinds of things we've been talking about, working in a very nonpartisan fashion. But I also, Rachel, think about it from the perspective of, of my kids. And, you know, there was a moment right after... Uh, January 6th, where I was having dinner with my husband and, and our two youngest kids, um, who happened to be our sons. And, and I looked at my sons across the dinner table, and, and I had this realization, you know, I grew up in a country where I didn't have to wonder if we were going to have a peaceful transfer of power in mm -hmm. the United States. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me, my God, maybe they won't be able to say the same thing. And, and that is why it's so fundamentally important that we, we ensure Democrats, independents, Republicans, that we, we work together, we vote together, we make clear that Donald Trump is not an acceptable alternative. He is not the lesser of two evils. He is a completely unfit man for office. He's already shown us what he would do, and he can never be near the Oval Office again. It sounds like you really don't want to think about what resistance or fighting for your country or trying to hold on to democracy looks like with him in power. I mean, you won't, you won't go there. Well, we're, we're going to be successful at making sure that he's not, uh, not elected president again. Let me ask you one last question. Um, and I mean this, I think, with the uh, coming at it from the understanding that I think I garnered from your book and from what I've come to understand about kind of your spirit about these things, um, which is that, you know, after you got voted out of your Republican leadership job in Washington, it was very clear you were going to lose your seat in Congress as well. And you didn't quit. 
you decided you were going to make them vote you out and not make it any easier for them. Um, but it would have made it a lot easier for you, too. Why did you make that decision? I don't, I don't think it would have made it easier um, because at the end of the day, the, the question really is, you know, what's more important here? And, and to me, there was no world in which you would say maintaining this House seat matters more than um, standing up for truth. Uh, and it became clear that in order to, to stay in leadership, I was going to have to um, tell Donald Trump's lies, and I wasn't willing to do that. But but it, it, it wasn't a choice for me, and frankly, I don't think it's a choice for any American now, um, given the stakes and given how, how significant this threat is.